Welcome to the Walker Art Center. My name is Jacqueline Stallman. I'm the manager of public programs here. Thank you for braving the rain tonight and being with us this evening. Um, this is part of an ongoing artist talk series that we're doing in this exhibition, Five Ways In, Themes from the Permanent Collection, curated by Siri Engberg. Um, we don't normally get to feature um, artists in our galleries talking with us, let alone two artists who are featured in our gallery at the same time. Um, and it's very rare that we get them together um, when they're featured on the same gallery wall. So right now we're in the portraits theme of the five themes. Um, both artists work in different mediums, but um, study the portrait. Uh, Wing Young Huey is a Minnesota based photographer and born photographer, featured here in 1998 and 1999 in two major Walker Art Center exhibitions, Unfinished History and Dialogues, Paul Beatty and Wing Young Huey, both of which included photographs from the West Lake Street um, USA. He's also known for his portraiture in the Frogtown neighborhood in St. Paul, which is featured here as well. Um, this piece is Hmong Teenager Getting a Haircut, Frogtown, 1996. Melba Price is a St. Paul-based artist, but born in Texas, which we won't hold against her, um, and raised in Utah. Uh, Price is recognized locally and nationally for her portraiture style and her unique treatment of her subject. So this piece you see here, number 12, is her piece, untitled, number 28. It was part of a portrait series at Midway in 2008, and it was one of 50 portraits in that series. Um, so we are very, very excited to have them both with us here uh, tonight in conversation. Thank you all for being here, and please help me welcome Wing Young Huey and Melba Price. Can, can you guys hear me? They gave me lots of instructions. Don't hold it down here. Don't hold it down here. So Wing, uh, yeah, let's sit down. <laughs> Thank you for being part of this and this conversation. Um, one of the reasons why I was interested in talking to Wing um, was because I use uh, photographs as a starting point for a lot of my paintings for probably the last maybe 15 years. That's the way I've been working is uh, using a photograph as a starting point. And so, you know, I thought it'd be interesting to talk to uh, a photographer about his process and um, the things that are interesting to you. And um, so um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is I just wanted to ask you some general questions about the, this Frogtown project and, and sort of the genesis of that. And, and did you know what you were going to get, or did you just kind of start taking pictures in Frogtown and start thinking, oh, I've got something here. There's, there's something going on here. Or did, or did you go, did you set out with this notion that you were going to really make this kind of epic uh, story about Frogtown? Uh, no, I had no idea what I, was going to, when I was do, what I was going to do when I started, but I just wanted to make it clear that I am here because you invited me. Yes. <laughs> and they asked you yes. um, who is another artist you'd like to have a discussion with, and you said me. Yes. And right. we don't know each other. We don't know each other, right. right. So thank you so much. Well, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I, just, I also just want to thank the Walker for inviting yeah. us and allowing my piece to be on this wall with all these incredible other artworks. Very honored, by the way. Okay, sorry, Wing. And uh, so we got together uh, several weeks ago, and uh, we talked for uh, an hour and a half straight. Yes. So we've got plenty, plenty of things to, to talk about. Right, uh, right. And then talking about how, how, how we ended up doing what we're doing. Right, and right. And Frogtown was my, my first project. Right. And so uh, my degree is in journalism, uh, and then I bought my first camera in between my sophomore and junior year. And um, I took a trip uh, after buying my Minolta single lens reflex and uh, I took some very ordinary pictures on this trip and for whatever reason I came back from the trip and thought, thought, hey, I could be a photographer. But I was already in my journalism major, uh, trained to be a reporter, um, a, a writer. And uh, so after graduating college, I um, 
cobbled together um, uh, freelance uh, photography uh, and uh, being a freelance journalist. Right. And then um, I finally started my first project and, uh, in Frogtown. Actually, I started my first project in Frogtown because I got fired uh, from one of my jobs. And it was clear um, uh, that I had lost interest in what I was doing and they were right to fire me because um, I wanted to be a street photographer like Gary Winogrand. Uh -huh. And I took a workshop from him. And um, um, so uh, my first project in Frogtown, I wanted to photograph everyday life in Frogtown. And uh, because I grew up in Duluth and I was always the only Asian person in the room. I was the only Asian kid in my entire school. And so if, uh, when I was growing up in Duluth, if there's another Asian person in the room, I was probably related to him. <laughs> so coming down to the Twin Cities and seeing the diversity of Frogtown, I thought, how does that work? And so um, I thought it'd be interesting to photograph Frogtown. And I, I knew University Avenue, uh, the southern border, uh, because of all the Asian restaurants and um, businesses but I didn't really know the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I was living in downtown St. Paul at the time, uh, living at uh, the Rossmore building um, illegally. So it was kind of like an artist flop house. And um, I was afraid to do it. And I was, you know, I had taken that workshop from Gary Winogrand and I thought I wanted to be a street photographer like Gary Winogrand. And um, when I was actually tried to do it, I spent two weeks just walking around Frogtown without my camera and just really talk, trying to talk myself into doing this. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and so first person I, I finally put on my camera mm -hmm. and I talked, the first person I talked to was um, uh, mowing his lawn mm -hmm. and um, he said yes. And then I first started approaching people um, um, just walking up to them on the streets and after a while it just became normal and I was just photographing everybody right. and people got to know me so they would just see me and say hey there's there's a photographer guy so mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. I spent two years and photographed hundreds of people mm -hmm. well so you know I I mean I think for me that's like a the process is like sort of this kind of curious thing that you're just going around and you're clipping photographs and you know like you know do you do you ever look at this image and go, oh my God, that's it, I've got to get a photograph of that? Or does it, is it later on when you have your contact sheet and you start printing and cropping that that's when it all kind of happens for you? Or, you know, I mean, how, you know, I mean, I, I wonder, do you, do you ever, did you ever feel compelled to want to pose people to make sure that they were, you know, is it all just spontaneous or? Uh, you know, did well, I've, you? I've, I've done all different kinds of, of photography and mm -hmm. different ways of approaching strangers. And, uh, you know, with, um, at first, I think I was just trying to figure out what a good photograph was. Right. And so, um, photographing strangers, uh, I was mostly interested in defining for myself what a good photograph was. And, um, it's sort of the photograph as this aesthetic object. And then after a while I started to think that the process of photographing strangers, maybe the process of photographing and inter interacting with strangers is as important, if not more important than the photograph. Mm -hmm. And so over the years, my idea of what a good photograph um, has kind of shifted. Right. But, uh, but I, never, um, I never really posed people. I felt it was just kind of like a dance. I walk up to a stranger, I tell you what I'm doing, uh, ask if I could photograph you, and a lot of people say uh, no. And uh, sometimes people call the police. I was giving a presentation one time, there was a police officer in the audience, and he said, we, I worked at precinct in Frogtown, we got calls about you. <laughs> but a lot of people say yes. And then once you would say yes, I would say, I'm not going to pose you, I'm just going to hang out with you and, and try to get something natural. I feel like it's a, a little bit of a dance. Uh, right. Sometimes I'm leading, sometimes they're leading. Right. Sometimes, um, but I don't say stand here, do this. I mostly just hang out with them. Uh -huh. And uh, sometimes I'm, I'm with them for several hours. Sometimes I'm photographing them uh, more than once. Um, sometimes it's just five minutes. But mm -hmm. I think I'm just trying to, I don't know, you try to be small, I guess. 
Right. Where you try to um, um, let them be them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think uh, a lot of it is I'm just saying, mm hmm, mm hmm, that's really interesting. Yeah, mm hmm. And then I'm not really listening to them. I'm figuring out how I'm going to photograph them. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. but you're kind of, uh, and then after a while, I started using my tape recorder. And now I feel that um, what I'm doing is telling the stories behind the photographs, which was not yeah. the case in, in, in the beginning. Right, right. Well, I mean, that, that's something that's kind of an interesting concept, that you're looking for a good picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how, you know, knowing when it's a good picture. I mean, I think I know when. Mm -hmm. Can you guys hear me? I've got my, I'm doing the verboten thing with my thing. Um, I think I know. I think I know when I see a good painting, mm -hmm. you know, I mean. Do you know when your painting is good or do you know when you're finished? Uh, yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, I mean, I'll have worked on something for months and months and months and, and it'll just never work, never work and then just have, paint the whole thing out. I mean, mm -hmm. just the, the entire thing out. But, you know, so, I mean, so, you know, this is, this are, these are always hard questions about aesthetics and art, you know, what makes a good picture, what makes good art, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think a lot of it has to just do with um, your experience, how much time you've spent with art, and, and yeah, I mean, you know, it's going to be, I'm, you know, I'm going to have a heated argument with somebody who has mm -hmm. the exact same experience I do, mm -hmm. but I'm the one that's right, you know, <laughs> usually, <Okay>. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, just when you were saying, because I was asking you that, well, it has to be a good picture, and, because I, I, I'd asked, I'd asked you a lot of questions about the subject matter, mm -hmm. and how much that mattered, and, um, and then you said, well, it has to be a good picture. Mm. You know, so how do you know when it's a good picture? How do um, you know? Well, I, I th in one sense, I feel like um, I'm, never, I'm never sure what's good. Like, mm -hmm. say, it's so on the contact sheet. So uh, I really switched to digital only about four, four or five years ago. And um, so when I would take uh, rolls of film, sometimes it would take me, you know, minimum a day to see the photo, to see the actual, you know, go to the dark room, make the contact sheet, and so on. But a lot of times it would it'd take me weeks, sometimes months would go by before I would actually see what I photographed. And uh, so I would mark the contact sheet, um, mark which ones I think are interesting, and, and make the prints, and then decide which one I'm going to exhibit. And uh, I'm never sure. And I'll go back to uh, contact sheets from 20 years ago. And I look and I say, why did I pick that one? That's not that interesting. So I feel like my ideas uh, of what a good photograph is, is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, so I think, I think even, it's, it's, and now I, 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 I don't know if it's so much, it's, it's maybe what you choose to photograph is more important than, than, than the actual photograph. Hmm. Really, you know, because I kind of feel the opposite uh, ab about painting, you know, for me personally. Yeah. But you paint from photographs. I paint from yeah. photographs and I uh, try to avoid any subject matter that seems too kind of sappy or, hmm. or emotional or sometimes, sometimes sappy photos can make a, a really, a really good painting. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, th I think I, I try to shy away from photographs that are already considered good art. Mm. And I, I told you I tried that a little mm. bit, mm. took some good art uh, photographs and thought I was going to be able to transform them and, and no one would know it and I wouldn't know it and it would be okay. But they're just, there's just too much weight in uh, artwork that's already been established that's good and it just doesn't transcend into a painting very well. And so, you know, for me, the photographs that I most like to use are uh, pretty benign. They're, you know, they're, you know, really amateur photographs. Even some pictures I take myself, which are clearly really amateur, you know, the, they're blurry and, and, you know, so for me, it, 
the picture is the most important thing is, at the end. So what it's about, you know, I, you know, like, it, it, it's not a big part of it. It's it's the actual painting at the end of it. It's an it's an actual object, and I want it to be an object. You know, maybe, you know, there's a lot of you know. People, there's a lot of things that are called drawings and paintings these days, and I'm kind of like, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a drawing so and painting. Meanings, I'm not sure. The meanings know? the viewer uh, puts into the the painting is not. You don't think about that so much. Well, You're not I don't think about it, but I know that it is an absolute result of of any kind of painting that has a figure in it. So people can't. There, it's impossible for people to move themselves emotionally from their own image. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think people are always looking for a narrative. And uh, that's generally not the thing that's the most interesting about the painting for me. You know, the, what's the most interesting is how the paint is laid down, uh, what's going on compositionally. Um, you know, if there's a lot of black, you know, colors, things like that. I mean, I think eventually, uh, it eventually it becomes an emotional object for me. But that's not; those those are never my st starting points. Um, my starting point is how can I take this information and abstract it and turn it into uh, a good painting? You know, and there's a, a lot of things that make a good painting for me, but. Um, I think the paintings that I most often gravitu gravitate towards have a, a certain sort of surface quality to them. The paint's kind of juicy, and uh, I'm acutely aware of the maker. And so those are my, my favorite paintings. But, um, you know, not that I'm, I don't, you know, not that I don't love paintings that ma make you feel a certain way. but. When I look at photographs, you know, like when I look at Gary Winograd or mm -hmm. Robert Frank, who just passed away, yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, I, I never get tired of looking at those photographs. I never get tired of looking at them. And I think it's because, beca because they're so real. They're just, they are what they are. They're nothing else than that. They're... Uh, you know, and the emotional content of them always speaks to me. I'm, o I'm always interested in that, the story, you know, that, that potentially goes along with them. And I, I'm not looking, I don't want a finite story, but I, I, always, I always like the potential that's in them. I, like I said, and you know, I think your Frogtown book, for me, has that. You know, they have, there, there are those stories that, that have so much potential. And that's one of the reasons why they're, you know, such wonderful photographs. They're so great to look at. And so the other thing I was going to ask you, so you said you switched to digital. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know anything about it. I'm a complete and total, uh, you know, ignoramus about I, the I would process. suggest you know way more about paint photography than I know about <laughs> <laughs> painting. But most most people most, very there there aren't that many painters, but everyone is a photographer <laughs> these days. <laughs> right, right, right. That's true. Well, there's a lot of people call themselves painters that I don't think should either. Okay. Frankly, but uh, they do anyway. So you know, so then I, just in terms of just another kind of mm -hmm. process question. So you used film. Yeah. So certainly the printing of the pr of the of the, mm -hmm. you know, that had to weigh into it big time. How the, how, you know, the process, what mm -hmm. happened in the printing part of it. Yeah, I think, uh, I bought a digital camera because uh, I was working on my chinese in this project, uh, which was published by the Minnesota Historical Society. And as I said previously, um, I started thinking that the process of what I do is as important as the resulting photograph. And so with Chinese-ness, uh, one of the things I ended up doing, because I went to China for the first time. So I'm from, uh, I, was born in, I was born and raised in Duluth, and everyone in my family uh, is from China except me. And uh, I was the only Asian kid in my school. In fact, I was the only Asian kid th throughout school until high school. And then high school, this Asian dude showed up, and when I saw him, I avoided him. 
and it took me a long time to um, really confront why I was avoiding someone um, who was Asian, and then I started to realize that, uh, uh, you know, I was born and raised in Duluth, Minnesota, and uh, you don't grow up with a mirror in front of you. The people around you are your mirror, and I forgot what I looked like. And so I saw this other Asian student, I thought, oh, he sticks out. Oh, that must mean I stick out. And I didn't want to think about that. So I think how I grew up uh, has shaped what I do as a photographer, just trying to understand just who are we and who gets to, to say who we are. Because when I was growing up in Duluth, my fellow Duluthians, they would say, where are you from? How many people get that question, where are you from? Where are you from? How many people get so much it, it kind of annoys you? So where are you from? I said, I'm from Duluth. And they go, we're, no, where are you really from? I said, no, I'm really from Duluth. <laughs> and people are curious, but you know, if you get that question a lot, what's implied in that question is you're, you're not one of us. So going to China for the first time eight years ago, here I come from Duluth, a, a Minnesota place where I feel like I stick out, but inside I feel like everyone else. I go to a place where I kind of look like a lot of people, and I really feel like a foreigner. So I started thinking, what if? Has anyone here ever wondered, what if? What if your choices have been different, family choices have been different, your life would have been different? So I started thinking, what if my family never left China? What if I was born and raised in China? How would I have turned out? What if uh, I was not the youngest in my family and I had to work 60 hours a week like my, my brothers at my dad's restaurant? I think being the youngest and being afforded the luxury to become an artist was, is not a coincidence. And then I started, you know, or what if I turned out the way my mom really wanted me to turn out, married to a, Ch a Chinese man with Chinese kids. That, a Chinese woman with Chinese kids, that, that didn't happen either. So I decided to photograph Chinese men whose lives I could have had. And I photographed, um, it's not a long list, but for instance, I grew up playing basketball in Duluth. I was always the only Asian kid on the court. And so then I thought, what would have been like if I had grown up playing with other Asians, because when you get picked for sides, I never got picked first, because there, are no, you know, there's no, there weren't any Asians in the NBA. They thought, you know, Asians can't ball. So I, I, so I, I met this uh, guy who grew up in Chinatown, Philadelphia, and he grew up like me. His father owned a Chinese restaurant, but he grew up playing with other Asian players. And so he coaches in Chinatown, and so I wore the jersey of the team that he coaches. And, but to take this idea a step further, after I photographed him, then I asked if I could wear his clothes. And I gave him the camera, and he photographed me as him. And then I put the two photographs together as a diptych. And then I interviewed him and wrote about the parallels of, of our lives. And I did this with people in China, I did this with people throughout the United States and, and people in Minnesota. And so I got the digital camera because I realized after I photograph him, I'm gonna have to give this person the camera and it has to be really easy to operate for them to photograph me. And that's the reason I got the digital camera. But I think one of the differences is, uh, it's not just the way I photograph. Um, I think, for instance, you know, before you take a photograph, it's gonna take a while before you see the photograph. With a digital camera, you're always going like this. You take the photograph, and you look at the photograph, and it's hard not to do it. And so I feel like you've lost faith in the photography process. And you end up taking way more photographs than you need to take. And I think um, it's the machine is too powerful. So I feel in some way I'm, a, I'm not as good as I used to be. <laughs> My eye was better before. For just making just straight up art is what you're talking about. You're thinking of it as an art. Yeah. Because you're kind of maybe, yeah. you know, sort of Moving back into journalism, I think it sounds like. With yeah, I feel like what I'm plan. doing is a, is is a, is a form of journalism because right. now I'm I'm telling the stories about the people in the photographs. Yeah, I but I feel that. that um, yeah, I think in in some ways uh, I'm a, I'm a worse photographer because of, of the digital camera. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay, that's. <laughs> but at this point in my know. career, I don't care. Uh -huh. You know, so but <laughs> but before I would carry uh, two. Uh, camera bodies, one with black and white film and then with, one with color. And then I would decide in the moment which one I would use. Sometimes if, if the light isn't very good, the, it's, the color photo is not going to be very good. And then also black and white, I feel like um, if, if the lines, it would show the lines better. 
And so sometimes I felt the color was too much and the color would become too much of the subject. Anyhow, so I have to decide in the moment which camera I'm going to use. And invariably, one was always better than the other. And if, when I was photographing purely in black and white, I never thought about color. I only thought about in, in terms of shades of gray. So if I photographed you and you asked me later, you know, what color pants you're wearing, I, would, I, would, I, I didn't think about that. And so then when I started photographing color, I, I felt like I became a worse black and white photographer. Anyhow, now digital, you, you just photograph in color and then you decide to eliminate the color later. And so I feel like it's my, my, my scene uh, has suffered, but what are you going to do? Well, you know, I mean, I, 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 that's kind of something I noticed looking at your books and the uh, information that you gave me, the, the project that you're doing with the schools. What, what do you see? Is that the name yeah, of the project? So, uh, so I, I make a living by um, giving presentations. I do a lot of uh, residencies in schools. And after my, uh, so basically I'm a self-taught photographer. And then after I did my first project in Frogtown, I would get calls from, from, from schools to say, hey, could you come in and, and tell our students, how did you do Frogtown? And um, I remember, I, uh, Vince, I think you, you asked me to teach at, at MCAD. During, during uh, when my Lake Street project was up, and uh, I, don't, I don't have an art degree, and I felt that um, uh, since I, 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 I felt very insecure about teaching photography, being a self-taught photographer. And so, um, but after my, my Frogtown project, I started getting calls from people uh, from, from colleges and schools to come in and tell us how, you, how, how, did, how did you do Frogtown. And I felt a lot of the questions they asked me, I couldn't answer. Um, why did you do this? I'm not sure why I did it. I just did it. Um, and what are the impacts of it? I, I don't know the impacts. Mm -hmm. And then you get the same question over and over again, your answers start to get, to get better. And uh, I was giving a presentation about 15 years ago at um, um, North Hennepin Community College. And it was a photo one class. And um, there, were, there was one person who asked some really great questions. And afterwards, uh, this person came up to me and I said, wow, I really like your questions. And she said, you better, I'm the president of the college. <laughs> and this is the best presentation on diversity without it being about diversity. And so, um, and then after a while, it was the sociology department calling me. And then it was all different departments calling me. And then it, I realized that what I was talking about was not about photography per se. It was about how I have photographed thousands of strangers. And so I do a lot of residencies in schools, and when I tell students that I photograph thousands of strangers, you know what the reaction is. That's creepy. <laughs> so I'm um, trying to redefine uh, what a stranger is, and so I give them all of these assignments to interact with their fellow students that they don't know. And so it's, um, um, it's, it's uh, educators who call me, not curators. I mean, no, I mean uh, you can call me too. But, um, that's how I make a living. Um, I, I have another question for you. Uh, you know, in your Chinese-ness book, mm -hmm. you know, you talk mm -hmm. about your family a mm -hmm. lot mm -hmm. and, uh, and how hard they worked so that you could become a self-indulgent artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering, do you think that's the way that, the, I mean, you know, I think this is maybe truer in immigrant families that came here for mm -hmm. a certain, certain possibilities, but it's, it's true of, of every poor, all poor people, you mm -hmm. know, who have kids who w want to become artists. And mm -hmm. so do you think generally that that's how artists are perceived out in the, in the world as self-indulgent? I've kind of always resented that a little bit. Yeah, well, how do you think about it? Well, I mean, if you, I think if you really break it down, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, they're doing, they're doing something that's usually peaceful and introspective and, um, you know, it's not like, you know, we're, you know, killing baby whales in order to, to maybe some people are, to do their work, but, um, and I kind of feel like artists often live very lean so that they could do it, uh, they can do their work and so it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem self-indulgent. I think that 
the tendency for artists is to try to do something that's important and big and topical and all these things because they're, they're so worried about that. They're so worried about that perception. And uh, like I said, I just think the mere act of being a, an artist is peaceful and thoughtful and good. And so I, I don't think of it as a self-indulgent activity personally. Uh, so in my book, Chineseness, I write about my parents. And I write that, uh, you know, my, I, I, I never once heard my, my, my parents utter the word art. They never set foot in a museum. Art. They, my father owned a Chinese restaurant. He comes from China, and um, it was about survival for him. And they never understood what I was doing. They had no concept of art. But I, I think that's true of kids born to white American families, too. Mm -hmm. You know, no, mm -hmm. nobody, you know, nobody says, oh, to their little bouncing baby, I sure hope you become an artist. Right. You know, it's like everyone has these grander, you know, they want their kids to make money and live in big, giant houses and drive fast cars. So, so yeah, you know. Yeah, and uh, I was giving a presentation one time and uh, 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 a guy stood up and said, you know, uh, my, my daughter wants to be an artist. And I don't think, you know, I, I tell her, you know, how are you gonna make a living as, a, as an artist? What should I tell her? I said, sir, what do you do? He said, I'm a banker. He said, so the world needs more bankers? <laughs> but, I know, there's no answer to this question. Yeah, there's no. I'm sorry if there's bankers out there, but, but you, know, you, you see just, my point, I'm, you know? I, mean, I find that, myself being well, a little why, resentful why of it yeah. sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, what, so I wrote in the book that um, all these stories that my parents told me about what life was like in China, they were just stories to me. Being a farmer in Toisan was not real to me. And so my understanding of their life was as in, 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 incomprehensible to me as me wanting to be an artist to them. And then I went to China. And um, by wearing the clothes of a, a relative who's a farmer, gave me more insight into my own family. And those stories became more real. And there's a line in the book where I wrote um, that it's not a coincidence that being the youngest afforded me the luxury to become a self-indulgent artist. My editor said, why do you have to say self-indulgent? And I said, because that's what I am. I didn't imply that all artists. I said, I'm very self-indulgent, especially <laughs> compared to the rest of my family. Sure. To be able to do what I wanted to do right. and not do what my father wanted us to do right. was, I, I'm way self-indulgent compared to my siblings. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. I just have one more question yeah. for you and then we're going to take some uh, yeah. questions. Um, just, you know, I just kind of, this is just kind of a silly question. Yeah. And because, you know, you, you strike me as a very, you know, sort of a serious guy. I, I, you know, it's, ni it's a nice thing about you. Do, you. do you have any, like, guilty pleasures like you know do you like to watch like you know stupid things on tv or you are you like in love with fast and furious movies or listen to millie vanilli or um, <laughs> do, you, do you have a, do you have a guilty pleasure <laughs> uh I, I mostly watch tennis tennis okay I play tennis tennis yeah. is your guilty yeah. pleasure yeah all right. all right i got that okay well, I how, think how about you Oh, I think TV is probably my, my guilty pleasure, definitely. TV and, uh, you know, reality uh, cooking competitions. I like those. <laughs> okay, we're going to open it up to the audience. If anybody's got questions, then Wing and I will share this. Um, so, there you go. Any questions? Thank you. Um, I remember switching from film to digital and that gap and sometimes I really needed that gap and um, lots of times I know when I have it and other times I just have to leave it because I work so hard on it I hate it so I have to have some time away from it and then I come back and I, I can do something with it. I still have it with the digital I'm wondering if you still have that and Melba I'm wondering if you if ever I still have, have the uh, film cameras? 
I have, yeah, I have film cameras. I got digital cameras. I use, I'm very democratic, small D uh, yeah, cameras. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but, I, but I still need, sometimes I need that gap. You know, uh, digital, lots of times I know if I got it, and that's nice. Yeah. But sometimes I just don't know, and I just need that time away. And I'm just wondering if you still need that with digital. So if I need... Uh, that gap, that time. That gap between digital and film? No, no, the gap between taking the picture oh, and oh. doing something with it, even though you can see your result right away. Yeah. Um, well, I think... Uh, Same question to Mel. I just try to never look at the, at the screen. Okay. <laughs> Good for you. I try, to, I, try to, I try to condition myself never to look at the screen. No, yeah, and pretend that it's a film camera. I got a camera that I, I just bought a camera. I can't turn the screen around. It's always going to show it to me. Yeah. So it's frustrating. Yeah, I think that's, you kind of have to, but it's hard. Yeah, so that's, that's basically what I do. But I think um, the bigger question is uh, the effect of, of digital photography. Uh, and I, I, I think that um, when I ask students, um, how many photographs, what percentage of all the photographs, let me ask you, what percentage of all the photographs that you see you think are real or authentic? And what's your definition of authenticity? Isn't that a real there? Are yeah, a real, a real percentage. What's, what, how, many, how many are, are real and what's your ide ideal of, 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 of uh, real or authenticity? Walter, yeah. It's hard to tell, but um, I know what's real if I take the photograph. But <laughs> yeah, because um, I'm just documenting what I see, and I'm not trying to manipulate anything. Yeah. But how many photog how many people out there are taking photographs like you? I mean, all the photographs that you see, uh, advertising, uh, social media, the media, all of those images, two percent are real. Who said that? Two percent are real. What's an example of a photograph that's real to you? Like, and where do you see it? Here. Okay. Anyone else? Family albums. So you can imagine what students say. Students often they'll say, you know. 10%, 2%, 0%, or sometimes they'll say 100%. They're all real, right? But a lot of them, you know, I mean, we live in the age of Photoshop, right? Most of the photographs they look at, they do not believe in. Then I ask them, how much of those photographs shape your idea of the world? How much does face-to-face um, -face conversation conversations shape your idea of the world, and how much do all of those photographs shape your idea of others and yourself? And they say this pretty much the same thing. 2% of face-to-face, -face, you know, it's overwhelmingly it's those images that shape how we look at the world. And there's so many of them that's become our reality. And so I said, so what you're saying, what they're saying is, most of what shapes your idea of the world is based on stuff you do not believe. That's the world we live in. And we've seen more photographs than any other generation in the history of the world. So, you know, why are we where we are? I have, I have two questions, I hope that's okay. Uh, the first one, um, what is your opinion of street photography when you don't ask permission? Is it okay if like, for instance, if the person doesn't know that they're having their photo taken, is that somehow all right? Um, and the other question is, what's your favorite Minolta lens? <laughs> uh, first of all, first question. So we, uh, so I wanted to be a photographer because of Gary Winogrand who never talked to any of the people he photographed. I and, read today and, yeah. that he, he hates being called a street photographer. Oh, what does he do? Um, well, he just, like, I actually wrote this thing down that he said, he said, uh, he thinks photographs are worth taking for each 
finding a way of transforming the real world into something completely different, into a distinct image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of said he kind of hated the term street photographer. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. 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 I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Because I kind of feel like, you know, that's maybe a process that I, I could, could, re could relate to, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, it's kind of like thinking about like a painter. Right, right, yeah. It's an object. Or it's, it's an object, it's a yeah. thing, it's an artwork, yeah. you know, that's the ultimate goal, yeah. that that's what you're getting. It's not, you're not documenting something, you're making art. Did he ask permission? No. No. Uh, so when he did the workshop, a one-week workshop in St. Paul through Film in the Cities, uh, uh, I, I, I followed him. And so, when we, so he, we could do it. So we would give assignments, and I followed him. He went down to the IDS Crystal Court, and he's at the uh, escalator. And people are coming down, and he's got uh, his, um, his Leica, and he's going like this. And like, like you look at him, like he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's taking your picture. And so people, so he was really, sl you know, I mean, he was, he was, you know, I mean, he, and people would, sometimes they they look back and say, w what was that about? So um, do I have a problem? You know, I think um, no. I mean, he's he's a photographer, artist. I mean, there's so many ways that people do their art. It's not up. Would I do it that way? I think for a while it was hard for me to. It's, it took a while to shed his influence because I, I wanted to, to photograph like him. But then when I started photographing in Frogtown, I thought, I can't just walk around and take pictures of people without them knowing it. And so I would just ask people. And, and so I think it's just a different process. But I, I'm not going to criticize other people's process. And he's a great photographer, yeah. One thing I, uh, I also read about Robert Frank was that uh, he said there's always these photographs where I'm clearly the intruder. Mm -hmm. He said there's a lot of them mm -hmm. where you know you get this feeling where someone's kind of going, "What the hell are you doing?" Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought that was kind of an interesting notion there. You know, it's sort of like the uncertainty principle: you're the intruder. You know? Yeah, I mean, he got something I, I, that I could never do. I mean, he got it. He got it. He described life in a way that I, that that yeah. So I mean, he's 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 a master. Yeah. Oh, you had a, you had, oh, oh, my favorite lens. I had a 28 and a 50. That's it. I had, I had a 28 and a 50. I didn't like to make, you know, a lot of decisions. And then, then when I got the digital, I got the zoom lens. And then, you know, and then I let the, rather than going up to the person or going back, I let the lens do it and it made me lazy. And then, you know. Thank you for doing this conversation. It's lovely hearing artists talk to each other. Um, I have a question from Melba. And Melba, I'm curious if you can characterize what happens in the transformation from you looking at a photo to the finished painting. Is what, what I know there's magic happening there. How do you think about that? Well, it, it's changed for me over the, from the time that I did these portraits, which was just, it was just an exercise in trying to teach myself how to paint a certain way to uh, how I feel about it and looking at the photographs now. And now when I look at a photograph, I'm looking at parts in the photograph that I'm pulling forward and then taking other parts and pushing them back or I'm, I'm changing it more, you know, I'm, I'm letting the painting dictate the uh, final product, whereas when I did the, this project, I was trying to stay pretty true to the image that I was painting from. It was an exercise in learning how to paint, and it was an exercise in observation, and all these other kinds of things. But nowadays, um, I'm really thinking about um, I just, I, I guess I don't want it to be as immediate. I don't want you to, you know, I, I don't want people to be looking for a narrative as, as quickly as, as they were before. So, and then, you know, I mean, paint does wonderful things and it pools and you can scrape it and it does all these kind of great things. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be a little more playful about that now, I think, than I was when I first started using, working from a photograph.
<laughs> Are we done? Are we, oh, we got one, one, okay. Again, thank you both for being here. Because these photo, the photo and the, and the painting were done a while ago, do you f feel like you are still that person who, who made that art? You mean the ones that mm. we have on the wall yeah. here? Wait, what year is yours? Mine was almost 10 years ago. Yeah. And um, I'm, I mean, I'm still the same person, <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, you know, arts and exploration and, uh, you know, I, I, I did that and I don't think I could do it again. It ran its course. I would be bored if I did that. So um, I'm just trying to keep myself intellectually and visually engaged. So I'm still the same person, but my interest in what the activity and practice of making art is for me are constantly changing. Yeah, mine was uh, tw about 24 years ago. And uh, I don't remember what I was like 24 years ago, but I'd, I'd say the, the, my process is, is a lot different. I mean, some of it's the same, but um, I think, uh, um, yeah, I, th I, think, I think it's a lot different. Um, I'm different. A lot of things that happened 24 years. Yeah. The world is different. You were talking about um, photographing and not asking a person, but if a person's using a Leica, mm -hmm. they can't hear the shutter. So um, it's, it's really easy to get that photograph anyway, you know? Um, yeah, so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melba. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>